in 1 John, we've been looking uh, consistently at what John has been teaching and looking at in relationship to the false teachers of his time. We, we get to this verse this day, and there are so many times that people would, uh, as, I, as I look at commentators, as I hear different people uh, talking about it, they come to this particular verse, and, and they just kind of feel like, well, you know, <laughs> John just kind of tags something on at the end here. And then you've got another viewpoint that says, no, this is the main message. Because isn't this what John's been talking about? Look at verse 21 of chapter 5 of 1 John. Very, very brief. He again identifies the people he's talking to as his little children. Those people he loves completely. He loves deeply. He desires to see them have the very best out of their life. The closest connection with the true God and understanding their faith and being able to live out their faith in that close connection. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. You see, I... I don't believe that this is a tag on. I, I would go with the people that, that say this is the main message. He's been talking about you've got all these situations around you that are teaching about a different Jesus, a different God, a different way. Those are all idols. Guard yourself. Be careful. We need to be careful. We need to be bold. We need to stand up and be firm as we stand for Christ. We live in a world where there's a massive influence of idols. There's two different kinds of idols we'll discuss in just a moment. But, I mean, you know, I remember growing up in the West... You didn't see idols in businesses. You didn't see idols along the street. You didn't have multiple temples throughout the area. Here in Hong Kong, we've got 600 temples. You can go in almost any business and find idols. You can go in many homes and find idols. You can find them anywhere. Physical, carved images of something. So, when we look at this, and we think about what, what John's talking about, first I want us to think about the biblical understanding of an idol. So, as we look at that, I want us to understand that a physical idol, from a biblical standpoint, is a man-made idol. item that has no authority, no power, no richness, no value, no anything. As a matter of fact, the biblical word idol talks of it as if it's a wisp of smoke. It has the same effect in your life. It has the same ability to do something as a wisp of smoke. They're made by hands. They're false gods. They're false images. And the world that John was talking to would have understood that very, very clearly. The Ephesus church, which was the, the audience of this letter, would have had the, the Greek temple of the goddess Artemis, who that was the most elaborate, temple of its day. It had been the most elaborate temple for over 600 years. It was an amazing building. It covered more than a football field would cover. All marble. 
And there were, there were people all around the city of Ephesus that made their living off of idol worship at that temple. Now, now you know, uh, when, I, when I visit around, I realize that there, you know, when I go to different areas of Hong Kong, I realize there are all kinds of shops that sell things to offer to idols. There are shops that sell the idols themselves. When I go and I visit in Cambodia or Thailand or, or if you would go to Vietnam or, or Indonesia or other places, you'll find the same type of thing. That was the world that they lived in. Now you know what? Christianity had such a major impact on the Ephesus city that people got so upset. Why? Because they weren't selling enough stuff to make a good income selling their idols, selling their goods that they offered as sacrifices in the temple because people began to realize this is a false, fake God. It's worthless. It's sort of like I went up to one of the stores, you know, where you sell the fake money that you burn. Okay? I asked the guy, he said, why, not, why, do I need to, why does someone need to buy the fake money to burn? Why can't we just burn the real money? Oh, it doesn't have the same ability. <laughs> I know what ability he's talking about. It doesn't have the same ability to make me wealthy. It doesn't have the same ability to give me an income. You see, what we need to understand are the idols of our day are just as dangerous. The idols that you have in your home, the idols that your family has in their home, the idols we have in the street, the idols we have in our businesses, the idols that we have become so accustomed to that we ignore or even there are idols that are destroying the lives of many, many people. And the biblical understanding of that is that it's nothing. Exodus chapter 20 verse 4 says, You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or the water under the earth. Leviticus chapter 26 Verse 1 says, you shall not make for yourselves idols. You shall not set up for yourself an image or a sacred pillar. Nor shall you place a figured stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. Nothing, no God of any kind, no image of any kind is something you need to bow to. And you know what? There are many of us right now that feel very, very good because we know we don't have idols in our particular house. Yeah, we may have family members, we may have friends that have them, but we don't have them. We may look at it and go, you know, we're, we're good because we don't go to the temples to sacrifice. Now, when a, a guest comes, we may go show them where some temples are because they're curious to see those types of things, especially if they're coming from the U.S. or Europe or something like that. But we don't get involved in that. You know, so we'll, we'll kind of look at it and go, we're okay, right? No, we're not. Because many of us sitting in this place today still worship idols. Because what John is talking about is any teaching, any heresy, not only the, the physical idol, but any heresy about God that you substitute becomes your personal idol. Listen to... This translation is the amplified translation of this simple verse. Little children, keep yourselves from idols, false gods, from anything and everything that would occupy the place in your heart 
that is due to God. From any sort of substitute from Him that would take first place in your life. Amen. So let it be. Wow. You, you see, we may not be bowing our knee to a carved image, but we may be putting God in a box that we have created in our own mind so that God has to fit what we have come up with. And listen, the struggle that we have constantly in our life is to allow God to be God and me not create the God I want to worship. So we need, to, we need to look at our lives and we need to think about what are the things in our life that could possibly be the idols that we worship? What things do we substitute for God? So we need to understand John is saying Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the one who provides eternal life. Jesus Christ is the true revelation of God. Anything else is counterfeit and a false testimony. And, you know, we'll have people that will say, yeah, but you can say that about anybody. Anybody can make that claim. Anybody can do that. But you know what? Can anybody rise from the dead? Can anybody forgive sin? Can anybody allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life and cleanse you? Can anyone bring you from death to life other than Jesus Christ? No, they can't. And they were teaching a different Jesus. A Jesus that didn't die on the cross. Oh yeah, he was born, he lived, he died, he rose again. But, you know, it, it wasn't the same thing. So be cautious. The Bible tells us, keep yourselves from idols. It tells us to guard our hearts. And that, that command to guard is not just a momentary command. It's an ongoing, continual guarding that has to occur. It's the same context of when Jesus said, Abide in me and I abide in you. It's that continual walk with God. It's the same context of when, he, when, he says, when Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. It's not that we keep them at a moment or that we abide in a moment. We abide continually. We keep them continually. We guard our hearts continually. So how do we even identify what the idols of our hearts are? I want to think about that just a moment. Because in, in Psalm 26 verse 2, it says, Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. You know, we need to go before God every single day and say, God, test me. God, try me. God, know me. Because you know the struggles I face. You know the dealings I deal with. You know the world I live in. You know the, the falsehoods that are going to attack me before I even do. And you are the one who can... Help me identify what those false idols are. Paul would tell the Thessalonians, you know what? We speak and we live and we act and we work not as people pleasing men, but people pleasing God, the God who examines our heart. And so, when we examine our hearts and we start thinking about the idols that we may be worshiping, let me ask you a few questions. Let's, let's think about a few ideas here. What 
could be an idol in our life could very easily be identified by answering some of these things. What are you willing to compromise your beliefs for? In other words, are you willing to say, I I trust God in giving me life, but I don't trust Him when He asked me to share my testimony. I don't trust Him when He asked me to be a Christian at work. I don't trust Him when He asked me to be a Christian in my family. I don't trust Him. You know, there's all types of things that could happen. There's all types of things that could go wrong. There's all kind. You don't understand, Pastor. I don't live in the world you were raised in. Well, you don't understand. You weren't living in the world I was raised in. You know what? The reality is, I don't understand your background, you don't understand my background, but I do understand one thing, and we both have to understand that Jesus is the only one to be worshipped. It's not about being an American Christian, it's not about being a Chinese Christian, it's not about being a public Christian or a secret Christian, it's about being a born-again, blood-bought, Christ-filled believer of Jesus Christ. So that when things come up in our life, we're not sitting there going, oh, how is this going to affect my business? How is this going to affect my life? How is this going to affect my relationship? How is this going to... Listen, if we will compromise our beliefs for a relationship or a job or anything else, we need to test that because something else has become an idol in our life. Think about your imagination. What do you dream about daily? Do you dream about uh, maybe getting a fishing boat or a, or a car or a bigger flat? Or is it more uh, intangible like, I'd really like to be real popular. I'd like to be really, really liked. Uh, you know, we, we live in a world where likes on social media drive people to suicide or the lack of likes. What, what's, what's their idol? You know, if you post a video and, and it gets two views, or if you post a view and it gets a, mi- uh, it gets a million views, is that going to drive you? Does that become your idol? What about your attention? And this is what I'm thinking about here. When you and I should be turning to prayer or Bible study or worship or fellowship, where do we turn? What distracts us? Would we do something else instead of pray? Would we do something else instead of Bible reading? Would we do something else instead of worship? Would we do something else instead of fellowshipping? You know, there there are a lot of people that are vaccinated and could come to church now that you can come if you're blue or amber. Uh, You know, there are a lot of people. But you know what? We become so comfortable. Some of you are watching online. You become so comfortable with your idea of how church is done and fellowship happens that it is actually becoming an idol to you. Because the Bible says there is an amazing thing that happens when we fellowship together, when we come together and we love. So what do we substitute for that? How does that work? You know, when you and I should be reading the Bible, what time-wasting activity do we turn to? That's our idol. Another thing, what a, examine your finances. You know, used to you had checks and checkbooks and all this that you could write, but you can go online, you can pull up your account, you can look back through. Where do you write your checks? Where do you spend your money? 
You know what? Uh, how do you use your disposable income? But let me ask you this first. Do you tithe? Because I'm convinced that if you do not tithe, it's because of an idol in your life that you love more than God. Because when you don't tithe, it doesn't matter. You, you know, you may be one of the Filipino workers that say, but preacher, you don't understand. I have to send all my money home. They need it. You know what? Keep lying to yourself. And trust that idol. And tell God that he's unworthy of what you've got. Tell God that he's unfaithful and untrustworthy. And you know what? It's not just the Filipino workers. It's the same guy that gets a paycheck every week. You come to church and you give your 20 cents or your $20. And you say, I trust God. I love God. I want God. I want God to save me, but he can't save me right now, preacher. You don't understand the debts I've got. You don't understand the financial commitments I've got to make. You don't understand the things I need to buy for my family. You don't understand if I give God my tithe. No, stop right there. If you give your God your tithe, you're saying, God, I love you. I trust you. You are my God. Above everything else. And you may go, well, you know, I, I, just don't, I just don't get that. Listen, the Bible teaches our tithe belongs to God. A tithe means 10%. Oh, but my wife wouldn't agree. My husband wouldn't agree. Are you putting that relationship above obedience to God? What are you placing in your life as an idol? What about our prayer life? What do we pray about? And when God doesn't answer our prayers, do we get upset at Him? Or... Are we wanting our prayer life to be such that we are focusing our attention on the God we love and we trust and we say, I don't care what happens, I love Him. I don't doubt His goodness. I don't doubt His mercy. I don't doubt His grace. I don't doubt His love. I'm just going to follow Him. What about your relationships? <laughs> I made it a, a choice that when I dated, I would never date a person that wasn't a Christian. Now, I know for some of you, you just all of a sudden go, well, that's not possible here. You know, well, I'll tell you what my pastor told me. He said, if you see somebody you really, really like, and you want to date them, and they're not a Christian, there's a solution to that. Lead them to Jesus. Oh, but you don't understand. Yeah, I do. Lost is lost no matter where you are. I remember one time in the university, I'd invite this girl out on a date. We got in the car, and I started up the car. We were driving down the road. I don't really know her that well. I asked her about her testimony, her relationship with Jesus. She looks at me and said, that's none of your business. And I said, well, if it's none of my business, our date's over. I turned around, I took her back, and I dropped her off at the dorm. Now somebody would go, what? You would do that? Listen. When I relate with a non-believer with the intent of carrying on a deeper relationship with that non-believer, other than a desire to see that person come to know Christ, then I need to be careful. I know there are some of you that are dating people that aren't believers, and you're, you're kind of wondering, well, how, you know, what's going to happen here? You know, what you need to do is you need to start relating to God more importantly than them 
and then build that relationship where they come to a relationship of walking with Christ. One of my friends, uh, he had a music minister that they were getting ready for their Christmas time, and they had an orchestra, and the orchestra needed a couple of piccolo players. And he, he said, we don't have any. And he says, well, you, let's see. The pastor goes, you know, a piccolo. Yeah, that comes in a little box like this, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't you go to the high school? Stand outside and watch as people come out and see those guys that carried the little boxes and lead one to Jesus. A few weeks later, he had three piccolos because he'd led three piccolo players to Jesus. You know what, folks? We so many times look and say we don't have options when we really do. What's your idol? What do you fear about the most? What do you worry about the most? What are you passionate about the most? What do you hope for the most? Listen, ultimately, our life should be driven by Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, it says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Later on, he would say, take, or earlier he would say, we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Listen, John knows this is a battle that's going on. I know it's a battle going on in your minds and in my mind. I know I have to constantly be on the guard or I'll become selfish. I have to constantly be on the guard or I'll become lazy. I have to constantly be on the guard or I can substitute something else for God. And John is constantly saying, I want you as my children to have a love relationship with God that is so major, so deep that it changes everything. Because ultimately, that's going to make a difference. He says, look, the last part I want us to think about is what are the benefits of guarding our hearts against idols? I want to think about it just a moment, very quickly as we go through this. Think about, if I guard my heart from idols, then I have a deeper knowledge and I have a deeper knowledge of God and I have a greater relationship with God. You know what? Because that, that's, that's what we want. That's what John wants for us. To be able to have more knowledge of God. To be able to turn our lives over to God and follow Him because He is the true God. Paul would say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 of the Thessalonian church, he says, For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols and serve a living and true God. Wow. We need that deeper relationship and it comes when we make God number one. We need that deeper relationship and it comes when we know we're trusting the one true God. The second thing I want us to see is knowing the certainty of God's amazing love. You see, in Jonah, it would say that when we follow idols, it's the same as forsaking the sure thing of God's love. So the reverse is also true. When we forsake the idols... We understand and hold and clearly understand the certainty of God's great love. That's why John would say, you know, you're, you're not a habitual sinner anymore because when you sin, 
you, you, you feel so broken. You feel so hurt. You feel so, so isolated momentarily because of that relationship you've walked out on with God. And when we turn back, we're finding that God is and truly that loving Father who is accepting us back. We have the third area under that, a personal deliverance for my sin and cleansing. You see, sin wants to constantly tie us back. Wants to constantly tell us we're unworthy of God's love. Wants to constantly let us know there's no way we could measure up to what God's standard is. There's no way we can do. Matter of fact, that's how he convinces us we need an idol. That's why you have to depend on you to get some things done. But God says, look, trust me. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 23 says, They will no longer defile themselves with idols and with detestable things or with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from their dwelling places in which they have sinned. And I will cleanse them, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. What an amazing thing. And then there's boldness and security. When we think about boldness and security, one of the things I, I think about so many times, we'll, we'll talk about Daniel in the lion's den, we'll talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and we, we talk about those things. We, we look and we say, wow, that's amazing. They had faith, and because of their faith, they... they... Listen, here's, here's one thing I want you to remember about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you read Daniel chapter 3, listen to what it says... In verse 17 and 18, it's not, not on the screen, but listen to this. Nebuchadnezzar had gotten ready to throw them in the fiery furnace. And they say, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And He will deliver us out of your hand, O King. But even if He does not, let it be known to you, O King, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you set up. Now notice their faith was in God, not what God does. So many times in our life, our faith is based on God giving us a miracle. God giving us an answer. God giving us finances. God giving us a raise. God giving us a job. God giving us the pretty girl we want. God giving us something. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they look and they said, you know what? God may save us. We think he will. We hope he will. But you know what? Our hope isn't based on that. It's based on who God is. Because no matter what, God's delivering us today from your hand. And if he chooses to let us die in the furnace, our faith is still there. You know what? When you and I have that kind of faith, we have a certain security. Wow. So, the Bible tells us, repent and turn from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. I don't doubt that in a crowd like we will have here today that there aren't some of you that may still have household idols. Today God's saying take that false God 
and remove it. But I know more likely that every one of us struggle with the other kind of idol. The idol that says, God, you are my God. I love you with all my heart. But I'm uncertain whether you're fully someone I can trust with my, and you name it, job. Relationship, family, money, whatever. And just recognize this morning that those are idols competing to replace God. So today, would you repent and turn to God? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know so much that in our world we struggle. We struggle to follow you. We struggle to put you first. We struggle so many times. And as you through John have spoken, you indeed are the true Savior. You are the true Lord. Help us, Lord, put our full faith in you and help us walk with you. Today, we want to put aside every idol that we've got. And we want to focus our attention directly on you because just as you kept calling those Ephesus hearers your little children because you loved them so much, you're still calling to us today and saying that you love us so much that you want us to follow Jesus fully and not be distracted by everything that goes on around us. Lord, for those today that aren't believers, they've never given their heart to you, it's hard for them to recognize the difference between the idol they have at home or the, the idol of nothingness that they worship. <laughs> That's really the idol of self-reliance. It's hard to put that aside. But Lord, draw them. Help them understand your great love and the power that you have to bring them to life. And Lord, for those of us who are believers, may we give you our full attention. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He is the true living God. And He wants to dynamically change your life. He will bring you from death to life. Today, would you give Him your heart? And as a believer, there may be a lot of things that you identified today that you say, hmm, that, that sure is a distraction, that sure is a distraction, that sure changes. And we realize that there is such a competition going on in our life for something else to replace God. Today, would you just say, God, keep me alert to these competing thoughts. Place my feet firmly so that I can stand on you and rely on you completely. As we have our invitation, would you come?